Hello, I'm Juliette. I'm an artist and organizer based in Manchester since 2013. I'm currently describing my practice as using collective listening and doing to create sites for communality, exploring the lived experience of the everyday. I'm mostly going to talk about Let's Keep Growing, a community-led gardening project I run in Longside with Mo Blue, a local resident, community worker, and member of New Longside Housing Corp, which I was also part of between 2017 and 2019. Longside is a densely populated, culturally diverse area of southeast Manchester, suffering from fly tipping, general rubbish issues, a lack of accessible green spaces, and is often described as a deprived area by its local councillors. I will say a little bit on how I came about doing this project, share experiences, lessons learned, and will also share the points of view of other Manchester artists either involved in the co-op, in similar projects, or both. Before I started Let's Keep Growing, I had been involved in the running of several DIY nomadic art projects or art spaces. The latest one was Legroom, a platform exploring the potential of movement across disciplines, run with Amy Lawrence. I was finding a discrepancy between who we wanted to reach what voices we wanted to platform, what was important to us like access and diversity, and what we were actually able to achieve with our working conditions. I was also feeling a bit powerless, both as an artist and citizen, about being part of the gentrification cycle in Manchester, a city experiencing rising homelessness and stark housing financialization. I had the opportunity to move into a shared house of the new Longside Housing Corp, which is made up of 85 houses and flats across Longside, Levensium, and Rusholm. It was started in the early 80s, and the membership requirements are a combination of housing need and wanting to get involved in the co-op work. Only a few members are professional artists. The ones I interviewed for this video all mentioned how the co-op helped them to be in contact with people they wouldn't usually meet when operating in the art world. Being around and understanding a variety of different lives and needs helps them develop their ideas around politics, whether they consider their work to be political or not, and whether or not this had any, a direct impact on their practice. On practical levels, the secure, affordable housing provided by the crop is instrumental in allowing artists the time to develop their artistic practice, but it also impacts on them as people and becomes part of their identity. Co-op member and artist Roxana Allison also started the resident group Belong Site with some neighbors, which set the grounds for her ongoing photographic series in which she gives exposure to people involved in positive projects in Long Site. Through the COP, I heard about Making a Difference Together, a free community leaders course funded by Manchester City Council and run by Amity, a community interest company who uses human-centered design to facilitate thriving communities. They were looking for people who wanted to make a difference in their community. By this, they meant their neighborhood. The course focused a lot on the importance of listening and used deep listening practices. I was familiar with deep listening within a sound art context through Alex De Little, who introduced us to Pauline Olivero's work during a residency at Legroom in 2017. But I was surprised and inspired to see this term used in non-artistic settings. It made me wonder what other artistic practices could be applied to community or activist contexts and vice versa. At the end of a climate change activist meeting, which had started with a check-in, I proposed to do a check-out, everybody sharing a thought before we, we end, and the person next to me turned around and said they'd never done a check-out in a decade of activism and didn't know what it was. I believe the checkout helped us all end on a hopeful and energized note, 
while also allowing those who hadn't spoken as much during the meeting to say what was on their mind. Going back to the course, we were asked to come up with some questions and do some research into our area by interviewing people. I interviewed residents, community workers, housing activists, and think my main question evolved over time until it became this, how to nurture co cooperation between new and long-term residents in a changing neighborhood. Before this course, I had often been invited as an artist to make something, often with an element of participation, that responded to a specific context without actually being given the time and resources to listen to that context, or with only being given the art center's opinion and experience through a tour by a staff member, for example. Spending substantial time meeting people finding out what they cared about, what they enjoyed about the area, what was already going on, what they felt was missing, and what could be done about it, was instrumental in helping me let go of past working methods and come up with something that was relevant to long sight. I believe much more time should be given to that type of open-ended research for any kind of new contextual artistic project. Parallel to this, I was getting frustrated with a little acknowledgement of the lack of diversity in climate change activism. I felt that not enough was being done to make these conversations accessible to the communities most affected to climate, by climate change, and also realized that getting arrested could affect my right to stay in the UK. Rather than doing office-based volunteering that would make it even easier for people who were already not worried about getting arrested to get arrested, I prefer to focus my energy on trying different formats, making space for discussions around the environment through food growing and community gardening, whilst having a positive impact on the area around my house. I was interested in the neighborhood alleyways as liminal spaces between public and private, and the collective creative potential of that porosity. In the context of Brexit, feeling like the roots I was growing in Manchester were being uprooted by news headlines, I was also feeling the need to connect with the soil around me without newspaper articles getting in the way. So this is how Let's Keep Growing started. This is usually how we describe what we do. Let's Keep Growing is a community-led gardening project working on turning longside alleyways into friendly green heavens for people and wildlife. Everyone has a relationship to nature and food. So we use food growing in small communal spaces, mostly alleyways, as a way to bring people together who might not usually meet. We offer community support around people's mental health and promote the five ways to well-being. We currently have around four core members, a dozen active or regular members, and our sessions attract between 12 and 50 people, depending on the nature of the session and the weather. We organized our first cleanup and plant up in Mold Alleyway Network late March 2019. Since then, we've done around 15 sessions. There is always an element of cleaning and planting, with sometimes some added activities like creating a banner, building a bench from pallets, painting tires, organizing a big picnic, or planting fruit trees and fruit bushes on the green space nearby. Let's keep growing, member Jess says. There's lots of opportunities and a broad variety of them. It can be physical, it can be relaxing for kids and adults. It's great to see women as well as men get involved in the physical work. It's kind of gender neutral activities. We have received funding from various places, including the Neighborhood Investment Fund and local housing association, One Manchester. Over autumn and winter, 
support from Manchester well, Manchester Wellbeing Fund enabled us to do some gardening sessions in the alleyway and some DIY art and wellbeing sessions at Longside Library. These included bug hotel making, bird box building, screen printing, and stop motion animation. We often team up with Be Longside, the residence group a few streets away, and are in discussion with residents from other streets to support them in getting their own community cleaning and gardening project started. This is a slide from a webinar myself and Mo Blue have done for So The City, a social enterprise that supports groups across Manchester to grow more food. We were talking about the key things we'd learned with Let's Keep Growing. And Mo pointed out the difference between communicating and connecting. When we set up Let's Keep Growing, we were advised by people we met to get a Twitter account, Instagram, Facebook, and started collecting emails for newsletters. Although these are helpful for others to share our events, some people don't find out about us or our sessions through these platforms, and they're good to have for funding applications. We quickly realized that the best way to connect with the people we really wanted to get involved in the project, the local residents, was to do door knocking as well as flyering, having an information board, and talking to regulars and newcomers during our sessions. Due to the nature of what we do, which is mostly gardening over time in specific sites, although we appeal to a community of interest, people interested in community gardening across Manchester. Our main focus is on the geographical community, the residents of Longside. The term hard to reach communities or audiences that's often used in the arts and can sound a bit like an afterthought is kind of turned on its head because those communities are central to the functioning of the project. This is another slide from the webinar. It's vital that we are as clear as possible about our session's access. Will there be wheelchair access? Will there be a quiet area, free food? Will there be financial help for transport? But also access to the information, which mediums we use to share information, but also the format, using illustrations, emojis, concise text, visual descriptions of images. But we also think about access in a broader sense. How do we involve people who have a disability or a condition that's stopping them from attending a group session by cleaning the backyard of an elderly resident who in turn donates some plants and pots to the alley, by picking apples to a blind resident who donates some as snacks for our group sessions, or receiving plant cuttings from a king gardener with a disability, etc. Lots of different kinds of people can be part of the project and can contribute in the way that's best for them. Mo Blue says, I think because people have seen us do a lot of the work ourselves, it gives them a sense that we are really keen to make a change. We go out and encourage others in all weathers and get our hands dirty. I feel that the fact that there is no clear divide between organizers and the participants give it, gives it more of a community feel. Calling it a participatory project feels like an understatement as we work towards creating situations that can be co-designed by everyone who joins. Also, me and Mo are the two people who manage the emails and funding applications and we sometimes invite people with specific skills to facilitate sessions. We definitely don't present ourselves as gardening or DIY experts, because we aren't. But rather, as people who want to make things happen, to clean up the area with others. We want to attract skills and talents, as everybody in the area has something to bring to the project and can get involved as much or as little as they like. Some people are very prolific gardeners who might add pots to the alleyway and add seedlings, while others might not have as much gardening knowledge, but be really keen to get their hands dirty and get things planted. 
people often come up with ways to get involved, which we hadn't even realized we needed, like Ashka and his wife providing homemade snacks in the alleyway. Often we'll start something knowing we don't have all the skills to carry out the task, but also knowing the group of people who are present will figure out how to do it together, or someone will turn out to have the specific skills for that job. Like that time we got a rainwater collector and a resident who's training to be a plumber led the collective task of getting it installed, or when Jazz helps kids get, get feel involved. Jazz says, a new family came to see what was going on, a mother with children running around not knowing what to do. I worked with kids, so I went over and started engaging with them, explaining what was going on and how they could help. Sometimes you just need that bit of encouragement to get outdoors and get involved. By moving away from the service provider slash service user tags, we are letting go of default ways of learning and working and finding new ways to relate to each other. Just adds, we can dip in and out, get involved or step back depending what's going on in our lives. We still feel connected even if we're not taking part at the moment because of the WhatsApp group, information boards and other mediums. We could describe our working structure as having several concentric circles around let's keep growing. There is no rigid structure outside of me and Mo, so people can move closer or further away from the center, depending on their availability. That way we hope to create something that's equitable and that means there's as many ways to get involved as there's people. At the start, I was often experiencing the process of stripping back ideas and noticing what felt important to me, but maybe not to others involved and letting go of elements that were superfluous in that context that might have taken much importance in a primarily artistic context. Letting go of artistic individual authorship and letting group authorship emerge. This is a quote from Danny Abulhawa, who also took part in the Making a Difference Together course. For the most part, my involvement in community work in most sites and in the city more widely doesn't really require me to use my specific artistic practice or wider creative skills. The skills involved in community organizing, as I see them, are mostly planning and public engagement slash communication which I don't think of as being skills specific to artists. I feel that often the community work I am involved in does not give me an outlet for my own creative impulses. I think this is because I work with movement slash performance, which tends not to be a hobby sport that non-artists are interested in, though I wish it could be. The way we envision a project as being part or not of one's practice can depend on what skills we see as being central to our practice. I consider Let's Keep Growing to be part of my practice and I talk about it as such in art context. However, although I would like more focus on an embodied practice to be possible with Let's Keep Growing, like Danny, more movement focused considerations are more relevant elsewhere. It does feel like a gray area. And if, for example, the project had started with the impulse, support or framework of an arts organization, this would have had rippling effects, which could have led to very different outcomes, maybe with more space for performative movement. Sometimes I feel conflicted about presenting it as part of my artistic practice not wanting to instrumentalize people, but rather to make that kind of organizing visible to artists who might be involved in organizing that's more specific to the art world. I think working or at least organizing things where you live can also make things a bit, a bit messier as I'm involved both as a resident and as a professional artist. The local funding we get 
is also quite limited in terms of being able to pay ourselves wages. Often we can pay people to run workshops for us, but not pay ourselves to make it all happen. So our motivations and the distinctions between paid work that separate from our free time and things we do on our free time for our own pleasure and well-being can get messy in a different way than a 100% art context. Danny says, I think that artists sometimes end up being the people who organize these sorts of projects because they have the confidence to assert themselves as organizers slash facilitators. That assertiveness that Danny mentions and experience of running projects can make me worried of not being aware of the power of my own voice, stopping others from expressing themselves. Even with the emails me and Mo sent, for example, I have more time than Mo to keep on top of our mailbox because I do not have a set job and I'm not a carer for family members. So I'm sometimes wary of making my voice louder than Mo's by taking over the email communications. When we started Let's Keep Growing, I was surprised how easy it was for us to get support from local councillors and neighbourhood teams. And I wish that support was more accessible to artists. For ex from my experience, there doesn't seem to be much awareness of what's happening in the arts on a grassroots level for Manchester City Council. Christian Berger, who also did the course, described our positions as mediators between council teams and residents in areas where there could be some resentment towards the council. Rather than positioning ourselves in opposition to the council, we do try to work with their teams and create more opportunities for dialogue between residents and council staff. I hope we're able to slowly influence the council's practices and policies through that working relationship, especially in terms of environmental policies. But sometimes it's hard to know where to draw the line when collaborating with public institutions. For example, Let's Keep Growing won a Be Proud Award for Clean Neighborhood in 2019. These awards celebrate the voluntary and community sector in Greater Manchester. Although we were touched and proud of the recognition, some of us were also uncomfortable about the glamorization of volunteering and community projects, when the reality is that the current benefit system can penalize volunteering. And as we're seeing with the COVID-19 crisis, the last 10 years of sorry austerity are forcing community groups to try and make up for losses to public services. We were also invited to organize a big makeover in our alleyway We Saw the City in February, which was filmed by the BBC as part of a new program. And also the involvement of the BBC helped create a momentum around that makeover and helped us get support from local housing associations and council staff. It did feel like a pretty extractive operation from the BBC. And their last minute approach with big expectations wasn't really compatible with the community projects. It had a negative impact on our working conditions and prevented us from doing a community consultation to the scale we wanted. Mo says, let's keep growing has grown very organically. People participate because they want to. People have the options and are encouraged to come as they are, and we will always find them something to do. We have a way of welcoming people and making them feel that their contribution is valuable. In other roles, I am very much a decision maker and people re rely on me for answers. I am very new to gardening and this is a learning process. Let's keep growing gives me the opportunity to develop my skills at a pace as, that suits me. It is a non-judgmental environment that allows me to transfer many of the skills I have, but in a way that is comfortable for me. So let's keep growing. We're letting a, context, a, we're letting a complex network of relationships evolve over time. And this complexity really can only arise with time. The nature of gardening is to always be in progress. 
So the outcome of Let's Keep Growing is a process. Our aim is for the first sites to become self-sufficient so me and Mo can focus on helping other community gardening sites get started around long sites and beyond. It feels quite different from running a participatory art project as part of an exhibition or programming season and then moving on and not seeing any possible longer term future for those activities. Let's Keep Growing has changed how I think about the impact of my works in art contexts, both the ecological and social impact at the time and the legacy after a show or event has ended. I feel like art students are often made to work in a reactionary way, scheduled around the short-term assessment format, and some of it carries on in professional life, having to achieve multi multiple commissions every year to make a living. I will end with another quote from Danny Abulhawa. Whilst I think artists do a particular kind of work and should be recognized as such, I don't think we should see artists as gatekeepers to creative practice. And this is a danger with linking artists too strongly to being the organizers of community projects. I also don't think artists should be regarded as natural community organizers or as people who have a duty to organize in this way, which is often the case in the way funding is allocated. I hope this has been useful for thinking about how artists and art workers can look into the communities they are part of and work to improve situations for the better. I look forward to hearing more about other people's projects across the UK. Thanks to artists Roxana Allison, Hannah Leeton Boyce and Hugh Val for answering my questions regarding the experience of New Long Side Housing Club membership and to Danny Abuhawa for answering my questions about the impact of the Making a Difference Together course on the project she does in Manchester. Thanks also to Syllabus 5 participants and Barbie Asante and Rhys Shelley for all the discussions, as well as Sarah Jaspan. Most of all, thanks to Mo Blue and Jas and the rest of the Let's Keep Growing team. <laughs>